Hey everybody, this week's episode of the r r Show is brought to you by the Paradox Initiative. And hello, Will. How are you doing, sir? I am doing fantastic, Richard. How are you today? I'm okay. I'm okay. That little complaint oh. I had in my wrist from a week ago, totally gone. It was gone like 15 minutes oh. after the show was over. Although I did get oh, some great. very good advice from people, uh, and I appreciate that. Everybody looking out for my health. Uh, but yeah, nice. everything's going fine, except, very sadly, I have no game on my table this week. Well, can oh, you fill no. in? Do you what? have a game on your what? table? Yeah, I was just going to ask, what are we going to do? Uh, I've got something on my table right here. That Look was very this. well-timed and a beautiful segue um, to sponsor the show, Paradox Initiative. The reason this is on Ruel's table this week is instead of mine is that is the prototype that I actually filmed for my preview that's live right now because the, the uh, Kickstarter campaign is live and doing very, very well. And then the publisher said, hey, send it down to Ruel. I want him to do a live um, you know, show during the campaign. So Ruel hasn't played it yet, so he is going to play he's going to play the role of hand model today while I talk about stuff. <laughs> Beautiful hand model. You missed your calling, sir. So, Thank you. this is actually a sequel to a game that came out um, over half a decade ago, I think, uh, called Paradox. And I loved it then. I love it even more now. There's basically two halves to the game. There is a, uh, a card drafting set collection, because at any given time, there's a bunch of cards up at the top of the board. And you can grab those because those are your objective cards, your point scoring cards. And these cards represent planets in the past, the present, and the future. They also represent different scientific experiments in the past, present, and future. And what you're trying to do, wherever possible, is collect sets. You want the past, present, and future of a given planet, because you'll get more points for that. But once you take one of those cards, well, take whichever one looks pretty to you right now, you go on ahead and say, I, I, is that a past, present, or future card? A present card. All right, so it goes on your board down below in the present slot, which I think is the middle one. Is that the present? That is correct. Right, okay, so you have two rounds to fulfill the needs of that card, because at the end of a round, it's going to slide, and then it's going to slide again, and then it's going to be gone. How do you fill the needs of that card? Up in the top left corner, it's telling you you need a certain number of red paradox particles. And it just so happens you have a paradox matrix in front of you. This is the other half of the game. You've got this grid of chips, and this, if you've ever played a bejeweled or bejeweled style game, it's going to come in very, very familiar here. Basically, on a turn, you get to do two actions, and that action is basically swap any two chips that you want on the board. And what you're trying to do, you know, that would be a legal one, but what you're trying to do is create a line, either a row or a column, no diagonals, unless you have a rule breaker, uh, to basically get four or five of a kind in a row of, of a color. And so... The tricky thing is, I, I, I misled, you can't just swap anything you want. You've got to swap based on the symbols. So you could swap two oh. different colored circles, or you could swap two different colored triangles. And in doing that, what you're trying to do is create a row. So, um, yeah. And, and if you can pull that off, you pull all right, uh, you pull all the... All right, oh, but you're trying to make a... That, that is great, except you want to make a row of matching colors, not symbols. You swap the oh. symbols to make the row of colors. So, God. like uh, that red you put over on the left, that was not legal because you swapped a circle with an X. Um, yeah. And yeah, so... So I'll put it back. Yeah, so something like that would be a legal way to be able to manipulate things. And then once you do that, if you pull four off the board, that generates one red um, crystal. If you can pull five off, that could actually generate two. And often you will spend several turns trying to um, you know, position everything so that you can put five out there. You can pull five off the board and be able to complete objectives. But go on ahead and pull those reds off the board. You keep one of them and you uh, apply it to one of the planets you're researching, like that red one down there. The other ones just go back to the bag uh, because uh, we're going to refill. And now, like any good um, you know, Tetris uh, inspired game, everything slides down, and suddenly everything is rearranged, and then you go to the bag, and you draw a bunch of new ones, trying to make a more pattern. So you can see that you could try to go for um, four reds in a row, but you've got to be able... Yeah, so like your second action could be to swap that blue X with... Is that a white X? 
uh, uh, on right the here. right up. So if you if your second swap were to swap those two, you would instantly create a uh, blue. But the problem is, you, the thing you're studying doesn't need blue right now. And um, these are use it or lose it style things. So um, you've really got to be careful about timing when you are going to actually complete these things. Sometimes you'll purposely complete something for the sole purpose of just clearing stuff out because I'm trying to get all these yellows together. And I, I, I can't use any of these blues right now, but I got to get rid of them. So you've got a very fun and very compelling and admittedly sometimes a very analysis paralysis inducing little cool puzzle game up there that is driving a very fun um, card drafting set collection game because um, those cards all the cards on the right are that you grabbed your first one from are in an unstable wormhole the the ones up at the top are the, the ones on the uh, yeah those those six on the right those are going to disappear at the end of the round and so you have to grab them because they're all gone very quick. But once you grab them, it's only going to stay in your area very quickly. So you're under constant high stress pressure to be able to get these, um, you know, get the right things to do your set collection. But it doesn't do any good if you lose them because you can't use your paradox matrix to make the right paradox particles. Now, everybody does have access to secret powers. Like you've got one right there. I can't quite read what it is. The face up little card in the middle on the right. Between the two this stacks one? of blue cards. Oh, this one here. Yeah, that one. Uh, by uh, the way, destroy. folks, Will has yet to play. Um, right, so that one would let you destroy elements so you can rearrange the matrix. And you could use that one time. And you can earn more of those powers. Another thing you're trying to do is protect the plants themselves. What is the letter of the planet you've got, Ruel? I think it says down at the bottom. Uh, M, as it, in Mary. Yes. So that means you are studying and actually trying to steal because we're mad scientists from the M planet. There is occasionally that you see that little um, wooden thing over to the right or the left uh, that's on K. That is the glitch. It will be moving clockwise around. And if it lands on M, M gets flipped. It is taken offline, and suddenly you can't score as many points for your M set of planet um, study cards that you've collected. So now you've got to spend time and resources protecting or rescuing planets that have been glitched out of existence. So everything is a constant struggle of trying to grab the right cards at the right time, but be able to actually fulfill them before they disappear on you, and also protect them on this whole other board that's going on as well. So, it is a fun, fast-playing little game with absolutely gorgeous art. I mean, um, you, you can only see so much, and we're not really supposed to zoom in, because one of the interesting things about this Kickstarter campaign is, over the first 18 days, they are going to be slowly revealing the art of the insanely powerful all-star lineup of artists that they have gotten um, you know, on board for this. They've got the Miko. They've got Denton Dutre. They've got Clement Franz. They've got... Um, I actually went and looked. I did a top 10 artist a few years ago. They've got six of my top 10 artists of all time working on this game. Wow. And today, we're, an, we're showing off the first one of these artists, and he's a definite favorite of mine. Let me see if I can find the art. Um, yeah, David Cochard. Uh, he uh, took on the planet J, and the thing is, every one of these cards represents the, the past, future, present, and future of this planet. And you might think that always means, oh, it looks like caveman, it looks like modern day, and it looks like futuristic. No, the artists can come up with whatever they want. And this is actually one of my favorites. I've looked at all of them, and I just think this is so sweet and charming. Then in the past, they were simple, um, you know, quadrupeds, just living simple lives. And then out in the present, they're very um, primitive. You know, they've, they've gone upright. They've got basic tools. And in the future. You know, they, they're dreaming about the future. They, they haven't gone to any kind of apocalyptic wasteland or anything like that, although some of the other cards do that. So this is just one of the sweeter, more wholesome, and lovely-looking card sets. And Dave Kuchard, if you ever get a chance, Ruel, to look at his board for Dungeon Pets in real life... Dungeon Pets is a game that could take two hours to play. For the entire two hours, you'll still be finding new, amazing little details of his art. He is one of the best artists working today. Uh, he's the first one uh, that's being showcased but every day for the rest of this campaign, they're going to be showcasing more and more of the art. And you can see it in front of you. It, I mean, such a yeah. wide variety of colors and styles. The game is beautiful. But forget about that. Um, every month... For Patreon backers of my show, I we do a special show called the Gen Jogs, where I jog Jen's memory about all the games we played over the preceding four weeks, <laughs> and she ranks them all the same way I do in a roundup. This was Jen's number two game of last month, only beaten wow. by Ark Nova, 
which for her was one of the best games she's wow. played in years. So, I mean, nice. yeah, Ark Nova is a once in a generation or board game generation yeah. style game, but um, Paradox Initiative ranked incredibly high. We both loved it to pieces, and it's on Kickstarter right now, and it is the sponsor of the show. And guess what? One of you folks watching is going to get a chance to win a standard edition copy from the Kickstarter campaign. Ruel, how did they win? All right, so to win your very own copy, folks, one of us is going to be saying the secret word during the show, during these uh, games that we're going to talk about, and you need to listen, hear the word, and then when you hear it, type in the name of the game that we're talking about at the time. So what is the secret word? Glad you asked, Ruel. The yes. secret word is Knizia. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do a pre-show uh, before this. Uh, we do it live on Twitch uh, every Tuesday at uh, noon Pacific. And we talk about a bunch of different things. And this time we talk about Reiner Knizia, the greatest designer of all time, according to uh, our I friends in chat. We uh, actually had uh, an R&R argument. Richard to say about that. But yeah, we had <laughs> yeah. an R&R yeah. argument segment we, where we argued. I yeah. argued Stefan Feld is the greatest designer of all time. Ruel argued Knizia is the greatest designer of all time. You all know who won. You have to watch the extended edition of this show. You can hit that eye in the top right corner screen or go follow the links down in the show notes where there's basically an extra hour of silliness. Pop culture talk, board game talk, personal talk, yep. all kinds of things. And from yeah, all of that, we, we yeah. have pulled Kanitia as the secret word of the day. Kanitia is the word. So one of us is going to say it during the show. Again, you're, you don't have to you don't have to know how to spell Kanitia because yeah. all you have to do is know how to spell the name of the game that we're going to say and type in the name of the game and enter. Send an email to contest at rado.com and you'll be entered to win your very own copy of the Paradox Initiative. And I do want to say one thing about that. Yeah. I mean, it does look absolutely gorgeous on the table. Like I, I'm I am learning. I literally just set it up here. I'm going to be learning it this weekend. Because over on my channel, Tabletop Tonight, mm. you can find me at Ruel Gaviol on Twitch. I'll be playing this live on Monday, this coming Monday the 18th, um, around 11 a.m. Pacific with Nick and Mike Murphy, a.k.a. the Brothers Murph. I'm so excited. Oh. Those two guys are awesome. Are they, they coming are over to visit fun. you? Are they coming to your house? They are coming over to visit. They're coming to the home studio, and we're going to play this game live, my friend. It's going to be so much fun. So, folks, if you can, come on over and join us. It's going to be a hoot. Oh, uh, yeah, that is Brothers definitely Murph. something to watch, folks. Um, yep. If you're watching this show years from now, for whatever reason, because you just wanted to catch up on everything, there will be a link um, to your archived version of that episode up there in the top. Or actually, I mean, just up there in the top right corner of the screen. Amongst other links is a link to Ruel's YouTube yep. page. After he streams his uh, Twitch stuff, he saves it forever on YouTube. So chances are you'll be able to find that unless you're on Monday, in which case you should go watch him live because the Brothers Murph are freaking hilarious. They are, they are. so much fun to watch. And... I'm very jealous because I've been to like three conventions where they're at and I've yet to play a game with them. I'm starting to think they're kind of oh, trying really? to avoid me. But Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? They are always in demand. I mean, they, that people love the Brothers Murph and they, you know... Yeah, uh, it's just, you know, when I get to play a game with them, when I actually go you know, here in Southern California, if I'm in the area, I'll just, you know, let them know, hey, I'm in the area, we got to play a game, and they're always they're always down to do that. So it's going to be a lot of fun, folks, again, Monday, and if you're looking, watching this in the, in the future, just go on over to my YouTube channel, you can watch the live play that we did of the Paradox Initiative. Excellent, excellent. Okay, okay. well, enough of all the bookkeeping, we're done with that, the sponsors are happy, and it is time to do what we came here to do. Count down the top 100 games of all time. Although, right before we went live, it occurred to me, we're now talking about the top 50 games of all time, right? Because we, uh, oh, we've we yeah. already done the first half of this list, and now we're going wow. um, from, uh, what, uh, 50 to 41. Is that correct? 50 to 41, that is correct. All yeah. right. Wow. I know. I, time amazing. flies. We are zipping amazing. through it. And uh, so, it, it, maybe this is the first time you're jumping on, because you don't care about a top 100. You just want to hear top 50 games of all time. Half <laughs> of this list are going to be uh, some of my favorite games of all time. Half of them are Ruel's. We've already uh, sent them to a third-party arbiter to make sure there's no overlaps, because, hey, it turns out we like a lot of the same games. And so you are going to get a very interesting um, and wide-ranging variety of games, all of which are some of the best experiences you ever have. We personally guarantee it. Uh, yes. Famous last words. Um, <laughs> yes. And, and as you'd like to note, this is the definitive list of the top mm -hmm. 50 games of all time, yep. folks. So Untouchable. You'll get no arguments here. <laughs> all right. Then. Well, um, then I guess we, go. um, we need to go with number 50. Do you have control, Ruel? Can I do. Let's see. Number 50 I, I just want to let you know, I've got some surprises this week. We're going to, we're going to, I'm going to surprise you. And let's see. Let's start with my number 50 or our number 50 on the list. Yes. Acro Theory. There it is. <sighs> Yes. Acro Theory, a two-player game uh, by two of my favorite... It's actually one of my favorite design teams, Jay Cormier and Sen Fung Lim. 
this one, I came across this uh, because of someone who tweeted about it years ago, and it, the name just stuck uh, in my uh, in my mind. And when I got to play it, oh my gosh, my mind was blown. This is a small box game. Look at that game, folks. Mm -hmm. That box is it's tiny. It's like the size of like Targi or whatever. Um, but do not let the box uh, fool you. There's a ton of game in this. It's mm -hmm. a tile placement game. You're trying to discover these little temples uh, throughout these different islands, and you're going to go around. And it's got a little pick up and deliver, and it's tied into this really neat uh, uh, economic system where you know some of the goods that you bring back to the island are going to go up in value, and then you're going to be able to trade those uh, for a currency to help you go further out uh, and explore. And you'll see the tiles that are being laid down there. You're exploring. You're using these little, uh, you know, different uh, networks to get to different islands to eventually discover these temples. And those are the markers that can give you points. And what's really cool, as you take them off, you're going to get additional actions, I believe. And then you get um, additional things you can do. Uh, the maps that you're going to uh, try to lay out. This is, what the, for me, the brain burning part is when you try to put those maps, the map tiles down, you want to position them in a way where you're going to get the most resources or uh, ability to get those. And you can sit there for a while trying, oh, this might work, this might work, this doesn't work. Gosh, for a two-player game that I didn't expect much from, it's given me years and plays and years of replayability. It's um, always a hit, whoever I introduce it to. And they all say the same thing I do. They all say, wow, I didn't expect that to be as deep as it is. And that's why it's our number 50 game of all time, Aquateri. <clears throat> Phenomenal game. Absolutely. This made uh, one of my shortest lists of all time pick up and deliver games that both Jen and I absolutely love. And it's because oh, yeah. while you are, you know, building up the, you know, the Aegean Sea and, you know, moving your ship around, picking stuff up, taking other places as needed, uh, your ship moves at like hyperspeed. Um, you know, there's no yeah. slow, ponderous move, 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 move. It just yeah. zips around. But the other half of the game that's so great is players have a uh, handful of map cards and you are actually trying to make the layout of all the different resource generating islands match the secret map cards you have as well. So it gets fiendishly puzzly. It is yes. a fantastic game. One of probably the best two player only, you know, couple style games there is out there. I love it to pieces. Yep. I am very, very happy you decided to put it on the list. Cool. Awesome. All right. All right. So that's number 50. Let's move on. Yes. Let's move on to number 49. Um, and, you know, actually in the pre-show, we were talking about this a little bit, about my longstanding love of designer Uwe Rosenberg and how he used to be one of my favorites. But lately, for the last few years, I haven't quite gelled with all of his games. But all that changed with Hollertau. Oh, my yes. gosh. Oh my gosh, uh, this is such a return to greatness from one of the greatest modern um, board game designers of all time. And, um, you know, it's well-trodden ground for Uwe. Not surprisingly, it's a, a Renaissance-era farming simulation. Go figure. The man really likes to grow his crops. But this game does so much interesting stuff. So many paradigm-shifting things. It is a worker placement game, as he has often done before. But I especially love the idea of a worker placement game where um, it is a communal pool of workers. Um, you know, there aren't my workers and Ruel's workers and your workers and all of that. There is instead just this one stock of workers. And when we send them off to do a job, if somebody else has already visited a spot, it just gets more expensive. And if you know, it, become, it requires two people to go to a space. And if somebody wants to go again, it requires three people to go to a space. And as you might imagine, these spaces fill up very, very quickly. Um, you know, whether you want to fertilize or cultivate or you know, get clay delivery or whatever. But they tend to empty out very slowly as you're desperate. Like, ah, oh, it's all full. Do I do I spend three or do I wait because maybe next round that area will clear out and I can get in there with only one worker? What am I going to do in the meantime? Well, that depends on what your overall goals are because the thing that really makes this game stand out and made both my wife Jen and I fall so hard in love with it are the objective cards. Everybody is constantly getting an influx of these tiny little cards that give you goals, very simple goals, sometimes complicated goals, that will give you very powerful rewards right off the bat. And at any given time, you've usually got a small handful of these, you know, three, four, five, six, and you are trying to make 
long-term plan. Say, okay, when I complete this one, that'll give me the stuff to complete this one, which will give me the stuff to complete this one, and then that'll let me finish building this other thing, and once I built that other thing, I can do this other one. And it's so satisfying. The, like, little mini combo chains you can create as you grab more and more of these cards. You get one automatically every round. You can spend time and effort collecting more of them, and so much of the game is about, you know, collecting the right combination of resources to be able to either get a lot of points or get a lot of something else that will feed something else. But there's even more going on with the game. Um, there is pumping the resources you can grab back into the local economy, which is tracked on this one particular board where um, you know these uh, action tiles start moving slower and slower to the right. Um, and once you've moved all of them, that basically increases your effective population, uh, you know, sort of. But um, you, you always have a tough choice of, do I want to go wide and try to achieve all of these goals, um, you know, so that I can move my population forward and upgrade uh, as a whole? Or, you know what? I've got an engine here that's really, really good at making these two things, which will only let me move these two particular elements of technology forward. And so I can't move my overall population forward, but if I can just keep pushing these two forward, I'll be able to start unlocking tons of bonus points if I can push them all the way to the end before the game is over. There is so much going on in this game. Um, you know, it is right up there with his greats of all time. I think this is definitely one of his greatest designs and it's kind of overlooked it hasn't really gotten as much of attention as more recent yeah. titles as like caverna or feast for odin but uh, as far as i'm concerned this blows them away definitely one of his best designs ever number 49 hollertow yeah uh, absolutely fantastic choice and we we had talked about this uh, mm -hmm. before we came on air actually about why didn't this catch on right um and just Maybe it's uh, one of those things people have had enough uh, farm games or whatever, but that's unfortunate, be. right? Because this game is absolutely fantastic uh, all, for all the points you talked about. I literally just played this last night for the first time, and I was blown away. I absolutely loved it. Um, you know, if it's farming or if it's polyominoes and it's got Uwe Rosenberg's name on it, I'm I'm all about it. So, all right. great choice for number 49. Uh, let's move on to something a little different for number 48. Yes, let's um, do it. it. It is another small box game, but it's much different than the last one we talked about. It is Arboretum. Oh my God. Uh, this is a <laughs> card game, friends. Uh, we like to call it, in our in our, my home, we like to call it Mean Trees, or some people call it Murder Trees. Murder <laughs> Trees is the appropriate title for this game, definitely. Probably, probably more apropos, right? Uh, yeah, don't let the, the box fool you. Don't let the pretty art fool you. Um, I don't know which version is in the video here. Is this the I one think this is the, uh, the original version that came out, I think. The original version, yeah. yeah. So best solo art, and you know, there's different versions out there, but oh my gosh. For a game that plays, I think, in 30 minutes, um, and it's it can play up to four, you are you don't mess around you're it's it's gonna it's a mean game you you do you cannot be nice in this game it's just one of those uh <laughs> game mechanisms that that works so well but you're gonna get uh hosed on every single turn basically and so not by the game what you're doing is you're but by your opponents make no mistake by your opponents yes yes absolutely <laughs> uh what you're trying to do is uh build a beautiful arboretum just nice and relaxed a bunch of trees gorgeous different types and you're trying to line them up almost like a tile placement game where you're trying to get them in a particular order to score the most points mm -hmm. and on your turn you just draw a card or you draw two cards or one card you place one in your arboretum then you have to discard another one to a common pile that everyone else can draw from and at the end of the game that's when it gets brutal it's like okay so now you're going to get points based on majorities like who has you know the most in their hand and at that point you're going to realize why did you hold that for me? Why didn't you put that out there? Why didn't you why didn't you let me complete this row or this column? It's so good. It's I think it's a masterpiece of card game design um with how uh, it just plays so beautifully and streamlined and yet there's so much uh there's so much tension in every turn because I I guarantee it every turn you're going to want to keep both those cards. No, you have to give one up and you're going to hate it when someone takes the card that you really wanted. So that's why it's our number 4 great Arboretum. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, this is a run through I did of it, and I have played Murder Trees, the card game. Um, <laughs> let's, let's just call it by its proper name here. And yeah, uh, yeah both Jen and I were blown away, but oh man, this is. Yeah, you, you have to go. I mean, well, the whole time you're like, oh, I'm so sorry I have to do this, honey. Bye. It's, ah! yeah. it's like, oh, I really hate to do this to you, but ah! 
Yeah. So, um, and and this is it's a it's a small little game, a very unassuming box. It's had a few different printings, different art styles yeah. have been done with it, and uh, yeah, yep. very well loved. Still very active play to this day. Um, you know, this one has not been forgotten. Definitely super popular game, an excellent yeah. choice. Number eighty four, right. Murder Trees. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Arboretum. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, okay. Um, all right. So we're we're just vacillating from uh, little games to big games to little games. Let's yeah. talk about another big game. Um, one of the bigger ones that have come out over the last few years, and one of my absolute favorites of all time. Our number forty-seven is Tapestry. Oh boy, Ooh, do I love Tapestry! Yes. Now, have you played Tapestry, Ruel? I have. I've played Tapestry, and I, I recently just played the latest expansion, the Arts and Architecture mm -hmm. one, and that was. Yeah, very, very good. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, it is. Um, this is my second favorite civilization building game of all time. There's one more that I love even more. It'll be coming a little bit later. And, uh, but boy, you know, you're right. I mean, it's had two expansions now. They're both phenomenal and every time i get a new expansion and more stuff comes out it just keeps pushing its way higher and higher up my personal ranking list uh up to what are we at 47 today on our group ranking list yep. and why why do we love this game so much well there's a few things that really work for me and jen uh specifically one is a lot maybe even most uh civilization building games really focus a lot on the old oh that's a nice civilization you have over there it'd be a real shame if something were to happen to it you know what i mean <laughs> um this game is while there is some player interaction it is very soft the softest of soft and in fact actually me attacking you is not really the mean move a person can make in this game if i attack you i always have to worry because uh, at any given time players generally have a hand of three four five six tapestry cards and these tapestry cards are all super crazy powerful. All cards in this game are monstrously powerful, but also very powerful within certain um, restrictions, if you have them at the right place at the right time. And um, one of those cards is the one that, oh, I'm just going to hold a few of these back, because if you attack me, I'll play this card, and I'll make you waste your turn and um, get nothing for it. And, uh, and you know, and so... It's interesting, you know. There, there are definitely times, there are definitely circumstances where, oh, the, you know, the game has definitely put itself in a position where I want to be chasing after you. But you know what? I don't think I'm going to. I think there are better things I can do with my time because it's just too risky to fight. Um, the benefits you get from fighting are not that great. The risks you face are ginormous. So you will never attack somebody with a big hand of cards because chances are they've got one of those uh, counteraction cards in there. The trap but, cards. Uh, yeah. What are they called? A trap. Traps, yes. They are literally players yep. laying a trap for each other. So, um, I very much appreciate a civilization game where I do not feel obligated or compelled to go on the warpath. It's there for players who want it and who can play the table well, but that's not what it's all about. What it's really about is, at its heart, a very, very simple action selection system. Because around the board, there are four tracks. One for military, one for technology, one for exploration, and one for science. And every round, you are just going to move your progress marker up on one of those tracks and do whatever that space says. And that's the game. This game has a ridiculously short instruction manual. You can teach this game and have people up and running in under 10 minutes. And yet, the longer it goes, as more and more opportunities come your way, the depth of this game just blossoms right in front of you. And um, But it's driven by such a pure, clean, elegant, simple system. Where do you focus on science? Which is the more random one, because you never know exactly what you're going to discover when you go on science. Or the uh, military, which uh, definitely makes you in a better position to be able to attack if you want to, or the exploration, which is the tile laying portion of the game. I always love tile layers. Or uh, the exploration game, which is all about getting the tiles that you then need to explore with. But all of these actions, as you work your way up, the actions get more and more powerful and more and more expensive to do. And the interplay and the interconnectedness between these four different um, you know, progress paths you can go on is so satisfying. Uh, you know, the game starts out really simple. You're taking really fast turns. Oh, I'm just going to grab a couple tiles. Or I'm just going to explore over here. Or I'm just going to roll the die and see what I might get off of science. But near the end of the game, you are unlocking super combo-laden turns where, oh, I'll do this, and that'll lead to this, and that, and that, and the other thing. And it just, the, the escalation in this game is wonderful, and yet it's always driven by the simplest, cleanest, purest rules you have ever seen. It is a yes. miracle design, and it also comes with really cool little miniatures for all the different <laughs> um, technological buildings 
things you can invest in that are a yeah. major milestone that is like this whole other mini game that's going on on the side where you're trying to build up your own little personal society. And you know the, yeah. the base game is amazing. It has a phenomenal solo mode as well. One of the best I've ever seen. And then when you start getting the uh, the the art and architects and all that, it just gets better and better and better. Number 47, Tapestry. Yeah, wonderful choice. Actually, could you bring it back on screen? Uh, uh, I, sure I want to point can. out two things. Yes. Yeah, because I, I I love this game and uh, the artist. I believe it's Andrew Bosley, uh, right? The art. That is sounds right. Yes, wonderful. Uh, Andrew Bosley. I always remember Andrew Bosley's name only because I always think of Tom Bosley, and it's the image of Mr. Cunningham. I'm just thinking of him painting all these uh, wonderful uh, art uh, pieces for the game. But uh, what I want to point out, and you brought it up already, yeah. you know, this game's about timing, and I think it's really wonderful how they've got this civilization game and simplified it so much. It's such a it's a, a, a brilliant design where you just go up a track and do the action, but then that's gonna allow you to chain other things as yeah. well, get resources, and it's just, it's all about timing. And I, I really feel like it's almost like a Kinesia style design where, you know, it's very simple and it's only a yes. couple pages of rules, but gosh, the strategic depth of this game is mind blowing at times. It, it, it's just, it's so, so good. I'm, I'm so glad it's on this list. I mean, I could argue it, it should be higher on this list, but 47 is a wonderful spot for tapestry yeah well great great call I, I i and i completely agree i mean the elegance the purity the simplicity yeah. and yet i mean that just leads i mean it's it it, it 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 blows me away oh and also it's really cool everybody gets a unique civilization every time and we talked about this yeah. in an earlier episode um games that have uh you know unique player powers that seem so powerful that they would be broken in any other game but that's okay because oh, that's everybody right. has super over the top crazy yep. powers it's just it's just the bee's knees 47 it, tapestry. A brilliant but game. what about number Great 46? Call. 46 is, you know, for some reason I've got a bunch of small box games, but I'm okay with it because they're wonderful. Okay, you're It's continuing. one of the greatest roll and write games of all time, Cartographers, that are number 46. Mm. And actually, technically, it is a flip and write. And the reason why I love it so much, Michelle and I were big fans of Polyominoes, folks. And you get a Polyomino game, we're all over it. You get a roll and write or a flip and write game, we are all over it. You put them together, it becomes one of the greatest of all time. Um, what it does, it does it really well. Uh, you are you have different goals that you want to do. You're trying to fill up this map, right? And you, there are certain restrictions that you can do before you can play some polyominoes. Um, they're going to come out in different seasons. And each season, uh, you're going to do two different goals. And I, I really like this about the game, where you have different goals for different uh, time periods of the game, and those change, and uh, you can swap them out between games and have all kinds of variability. Yep. But eventually, at some point, one of those monsters are going to come out, and they're going to uh, block you. And those things are no good because they're going to cause you to lose points. And what you do, I, I thought it was a really interesting design choice. I thought it was cool where you have to give your sheet to another player, and they, they're going to mess you up by putting those monsters or whatever they're called onto your sheet. So you have to find a way to surround them with other pieces, uh, other you know terrain to uh, negate, the, negate those points so you can get back on the positive side. Oh, it, it's so good. It's a nice little puzzle that they've done here. They've created here. And you, as you can see, the run through, uh, you have some special abilities that you can spend uh, some of your coins on to, you know, uh, bypass the rules. It plays in about 45 minutes. It's thinkier than than you would expect, which yeah. I really appreciate about the game. Um, you are It's not your typical, hey, let's just roll a bunch of dice and, you know, score it. No, uh, this is a, a thinkier game based on the role player universe. I, I really like that role player universe uh, from Thunderworks Games, uh, Fantasy Universe. And you you could actually use, I think they include some uh, promo cards that you can use in role player and uh, the expansion. But I love Cartographers. It's uh, one of those games that will never leave my shelves. That's why it's our number 46. Uh, game of all time. It is an excellent choice. People love this to bits. I think this is probably one of the most well-loved, highly regarded roll and rights or flip and rights um, on the yeah. market. And yeah, with such good reason. You know, it uses that same trick as Fister's, oh, what was it? Um, Isle of Sky. Where, oh, here's the four objectives, and you're going to score them multiple times over yes. the course of the game. So you have short-term goals and long-term goals that you're trying to balance. And, yeah, I, I think it's amazing, too. This could be my highest-ranked roll and write, or, again, flip and write of all time, yeah. if it weren't for, as you said, that extra little bit where, oh, when the monsters attack, Heruel, do your worst. Yeah. Pick the single worst place <laughs> that will completely destroy all my plans. Oh, you I did a really you good job like there, yeah. didn't you? That's great. 
Thanks. Don't get me wrong. I don't <laughs> mind you doing that. I just don't want to do it to you. And it drives me absolutely batty. Yeah. It's interesting. When you play yeah. the game solo, it has a completely different way of dealing with the monsters. Yeah. Where they're, If I recall correctly, I think they're all just deployed before setup begins. Or no, no, they, they still come out at no. certain times. Or I, I forget. Yeah. They, but, they come out certain times, but they follow a particular pattern. Right. Like they're going to tell you, start in the right corner, then you go clockwise until you find a space. Point. That's what it is, yes. And a lot of people yeah. say, well, Rado, you love it so much. Why don't you just apply those solo rules? to the multiplayer game. The problem is, the way those monsters are going to come out will inevitably, randomly favor one player hugely over another. And um, right. and so that's the thing. I mean, if, if this game just came with Care Bear-friendly rules where it said, hey, you know what? As part of setup, draw the monster cards, put the monster cards on so they're just another objective we can all build around. And now, just go yeah. have fun, do the best you can. This would be in my top 25 games of all time, period. Uh, it's oh, so wow. good. But, you know, wow. Jen and I found... Yeah. They, oh, oh, it's that time. Here. Let, honey, oh, please, get me, let me see. How, can, how badly can I hurt you? How badly can I mess you up? And, I mean, you... Yeah. What's wrong with me, Ruel? Why can't I enjoy that? How can you enjoy doing that? You're a nice guy. It's, it's just a game, my friend. There you go. <laughs> it's the number of times I've heard that. And again, I don't mind it being it. done it's... to me. I just hate doing it yeah. to other people, which is what kind of... I, I, but... I get it. Yeah. It may not be for everyone. Yep. Yeah. But, oh man, I mean, if, if, if you're cool with that, I mean, this is by far one of the best rolling rights ever made. Um, Agreed. Um, but, anyway. but not quite as good as our next game, number 45, Aeon's End, which, oh my gosh, I love this one so much. Yeah. Um, Aeon's End is a cooperative fantasy deck building adventure game where everyone is working together to try to save a, a small fantasy town that are under onslaught from, really, there's no better way to describe it, a big gigantic boss monster straight out of yep. a uh, video game. And every time you play, everybody's going to get their own unique playable character with their own unique special powers. Uh, you're going to have, going up against a particularly interesting uh, uh, boss who has uh, their own deck of stuff they're going to throw at you. And you are building your deck as fast as you possibly can to fill it up with, oh, what are they? Gems, which are the source of mana in this game. And, um very sundry attack spells that you can use to fight off the bad guy and all his minions before he completely destroys the town. I mean, pretty much everything is abstracted away, but um, the gameplay is so good. And more than anything else, for me, it's because this is a co-op game that really pushes the cooperation so much more. I mean, a lot of times, a, a, oh, this is a good co-op game, but really, we're just kind of doing our own thing, and every once in a while, oh, maybe I'll give you a potion because you're kind of hurt. In this game, so many of the special powers on so many of the cards are like, well, this isn't really going to be very good in a soul. Oh, but if I play this on your turn, when you need to do this other thing, yes, I'm going to take this. I mean, um, and, you know, and, and, uh, and this game, Unlike pretty much every other deck builder under the sun. Because deck builders, of course, were popularized by Dominion, which is an amazing design for Donald X Macarino. But one of the cornerstones of a deck builder is, hey, once the deck is empty, take your discard pile, shuffle it up, start drawing again. I like to call deck builder games kind of broken engine games. Because my deck is an engine of stuff I want to do, and I want it to all interact, but it's all shuffled up. It's all gobbledygook. Aeon's End, it does so many things, but probably its most brilliant thing is, once your draw deck is empty, instead of taking your discard pile, shuffling it, you just take your discard pile and flip it over, and it's your draw pile. So every step of the way, every card you discard is an interesting decision. Well, do I discard this card first, or do I discard this card first? Because you're trying to actually get those cards that will combo well together to be clumped together so that you're more likely to draw them at the same time. So unlike most engine building deck builders, where you never know what you're going to get. Here you are sculpting a perfect streamlined fantasy battle mage to fight the increasingly powerful um, boss that just gets tougher and tougher as it throws more and more stuff at you. And so the, uh, the deck building is second to none. Honestly, yeah. I kind of wish Donald X Vaccarino, back when he was making Dominion, said, hey, you know what? What if I don't do a shuffle? What if I just flip? Because it's so satisfying. <laughs> you have so much control. If you don't play a card, you can keep it in your hand. You don't have to discard unused cards. You can... Um, and because this game is all about cooperation, in a, in, a, in a lesser game, it would be very, very difficult for me to use all these cooperative powers because I just never have it at the right time when you need it. But in this game, I control my deck in a way that just doesn't 
doesn't exist in other ones. So I can always help you. You can always help me, and um, we can set up to take down whatever the game throws at us. Aeon's End has um, gotten a ton of expansion concepts. We're actually showing a prototype of one of the second legacy game. It's actually had two legacy releases in addition yep. to a ton of expansions. And now it's getting a new spinoff called Astro Knights, which is basically the same game, but you know, kind of streamlined and a bit quicker playing. Uh, I love every iteration of this I've played so far. And uh, I mean, just talking about it now, it makes me want to play it real, real bad. Number 45, okay. Aeon's End. Yeah, I, I love that uh, mechanism of instead of, you know, reshuffling, you're just flipping it over. I think that's yeah. a genius move. I'd love to see more deck builders try that, in fact. I can only know, think like, of one not? other one that does it. It was uh, from Ryan Lockett. I want to I want to say, I like, think it was Ancient World oh. or something like that? Yeah. Yep. That was one of his uh, uh, older games, Yeah, one right? of his earlier ones. And it's just, why yeah. hasn't this become more common? It's yeah, so Yeah, I don't know why. But I mean, yeah, you're wrong. right. It, they do well. Yeah, yeah. I, I love a broken engine builder, too, but... It's kind of yeah. nice to do something different. And Aeon's End is so different and so much yeah, fun. Fantastic. All right. Great call. Uh, so let's move on to our number 44. Now, I'm going to admit, right. I did not know where to put this on our, li on our list. I had no idea where to rank it. But okay. after thinking, well, I had to put this one. And I'm sort of cheating it a little bit. Ticket to Ride. But the one I really enjoy is the uh, Pennsylvania expansion the most. But then I'm thinking about the overall impact of, of the game, you know, and... Um, I, I couldn't really decide, but so I'm going to go with base ticket to ride. Um, okay. I think it's uh, it, it still holds up to this day. It may not be the one that I play all the time or you play all the time. I know a lot of people prefer the smaller uh, versions like London or New York. Mm -hmm. We love Pennsylvania because it has a, um, and actually there we are, uh, Michelle, Lauren, and I playing. That's one of our favorite family games uh, because it has a stock element, uh, sort of like set collection. Uh, but you know, this game, there, there's no doubt about how influential this is. I mean, this yeah. game has sold millions of copies. Hugely uh, important. You know, it is, yeah, it is the game that got my family into games. If it wasn't for Ticket to Ride, really? Michelle and Lauren, they, yeah, they, they, I mean, they would be playing games, but I don't think they'd be as into modern games as as we are as a family. Uh, so that that's why, you know, it's, for me, I, I didn't know where to rank it. I mean, it's so influential. We still enjoy it. We have played the base game every now and then, um, but we do uh, seem to go back to Pennsylvania, but it, it's a network building game, folks. I mean, I don't know who's not played it, but it's a network building game, yeah. uh, hand management game, and you're, you're collecting sets of different colors to place um, the uh, trains out there, and you're going to play until someone's down to like two or uh, two, one, zero, one or two trains, and you mm -hmm. score it up. You get points on your uh, routes. You get points for, um, uh, as you go in the game, you get points for how many trains you put out at once. Um, and I, I do want to point this out. It has, it was like the game that really showed me that, you know, games can be colorblind friendly. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, some of those colors, the greens and reds mess with me. But if you look at the board, each color has a unique icon. So I yep, know like the, the uh, purple ones or purple slash pink ones have like a little, you know, circle or whatever. Um, but I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. this game has been so influential and so big in my household that I had to find a place to put it on the list. So that's why we put it at number 44, Ticket to Ride. Right. And the Ticket to Ride franchise as a whole, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Your Pretty personal much, right? favorite being the Pennsylvania map because of the addition yeah. of kind of this side stock market manipulation game. Yes. Right. Kind yeah. of hinting at, you know, the bigger, more complex train games out there while keeping it right. family friendly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my poison has always been it. Ticket to Ride Europe. That was my introduction to it, and yep. um, yeah, with the, with the with the tunnels and all that stuff, and and just the wonderful European board that is really kind of tough to navigate. Brilliant game. These days, you're right. I would probably if if you want to. Uh, TT Army, I just want to bust out London because after yeah. having played those super hyper efficient, there's Ticket to Ride London in New York, and I think Amsterdam just came out. These are basically oh, right. taking. It makes me wonder. Okay, Ticket to Ride was always brilliant. Why does it take me 45 minutes to play Ticket to Ride? It should take 10 minutes yeah. so I can play three games of it really quickly. But yeah, yeah so true. brilliant. The the combination of route building and basically rummy style um, you know, card yeah. Uh, yeah. drafting, it's so brilliant. Um, you know, And it, it will forever be. I mean, this is our generation's monopoly. You know, I mean, this is going to be totally. the thing that defines yep. 50 years from now what people think of board games because it's so breakthrough and so important i'm yeah. really glad it's on the list definitely cool all right cool 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 yeah but let's go on to our number 43 what you got for us all right i'm happy to do that yeah there's a ticket to ride for everybody you just got to find the right one um definitely. but moving on to number 43 we've got gil hova's the networks which i oh, as nice. another game i adore let's see here 
I, oh my, I remember my run-through of it is of an ugly prototype. Let me see if I can find the better one I've got. I've got a really good run-through of it here. Let me just put that on. I should have actually done this ahead of time. That would have been professional of me, wouldn't it? The networks. Oh, that's all good. All right. You're very kind. Let's see. This will be yeah. a, an exclusive uh, Rotto Relaxes video that I played with my wife, Jen, last year uh, with one of the expansions, the executive expansions. All right. Here oh, okay. we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So bear in mind, there's a little bit more here on screen than you would normally get, but yeah. Okay. There's a few reasons this ranks so high. Um, one is... I love the subject matter. I have been a TV junkie my entire life, ever since I was a little kid. And uh, to this to this day, even though I'm a 53-year-old little kid uh, who's still tra transported to magical worlds every night. Um, and so a game all about being a network executive trying to develop the perfect show with the perfect cast and the perfect sponsor and, um, and trying to get it in front of audiences so I can make money, so I can develop more shows. Just the subject matter alone is going to be so compelling and interesting to me. But even if it wasn't, I mean, uh, this could be, I don't know, um, you know, set in the modern art world or something I don't care about at all. It could be set in the high fashion world. I'd still love it to pieces because it is a brilliant card drafting game where there are several different types of cards available to you. Since it's a network TV, there's the shows themselves, there are the actors, there are the sponsors, and then there are, um, you know, special uh, bonus cards you can use and whatnot. And you're trying to grab the right cards, but you're trying to... I mean, it's not really a set collection game because this isn't like, oh, I just need to get a bunch of Western cards. Um, although you can try to go for that. You can try to go, oh, I'm going to make a Western show and try to get a Western, um, you know, focus star and somebody that might fit there. But it's, it's rare that that happens. It's more often than not, okay, I'm going to try and make a new Western and... As crazy as it sounds, this sitcom actor is perfect for it because I need to put it on this night and this is my comedy night. So you have this really interesting set of very thematic concerns about what you're going to try to put together to make the best um, you know, uh, nightly lineup for shows so you can make the most money. And um, so it, at its heart, it's a card drafting game. Every, every turn, you're going to grab a card. At the beginning of every round, there's just a big explosion of cards, all of which have you know very cool um ways to interact and combine with other cards. It also has a really wonderful, quirky art style that I absolutely love. And um, yeah, so the card drafting and the, um, it's not exactly engine building, but the, you know, combining all these cards together is so satisfying when you get a hit show. But just like real life, eventually audiences will get tired no matter how good the show is. So you're always having to make tough choices about, okay, when's the time to bump this down to rerun so I can make room for a new show? But I've got so many things I benefit from this besides just money. i got to drag this show out as long as I can. And you see that in real life. Sometimes, why? Why is this show still on the air? Oh, probably because some crazy yeah. executive has his reasons. And you are that executive in this game. Now... This game I've always really, really loved, but it wasn't until I played the Executives expansion that it put it into my top 100 games of all time, into my top 50 games of all time, because it introduces a bunch of new things, most importantly, um, you know, cool player special powers that are tied to the network, whether you're a, uh, you know, a 24-hour news network or a a public network or a, you know an HBO type network, and um, the the it's really networks plus the executives that comes in so high. But I would happily play this game any day of the week. It is so much fun, and um, I, maybe it wouldn't be true for everybody, but Jen and I we always find ourselves laughing out loud at the crazy. Um, just it's such a, I mean, and often it was, I would totally watch that show. Why doesn't this show exist uh, <laughs> on network television? It's, it's a blast. It's uh, number 43, the networks. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think the sense of humor, I mean, the sense of humor in the game is great, but just those, when you create those shows, like, yeah, I would totally watch this. And it's like so bizarre and so wacky. And, yeah. Uh, there's always that moment in the game. I, I'm so glad you brought that up. I need to play it with the expansion. I haven't played with the expansion yet. And I feel like it would go up on my own personal list. I mean, I, it's already highly regarded by myself, but yeah, I think it will go even higher with the expansion. Great call. Yeah. Okay. Let's okay. move on to number 42. Yep. We are almost there. I What's that? What we got? Uh, this is i'm gonna it's the greatest of its genre uh, okay by far the greatest dexterity game of all time crokinol it's our number 42 folks okay. greatest dexterity game of all time um it is it's so simple and brilliant and i love the fact that this game this is over 100 years old i think it's like a 150 year old game and as you can see our friend uh, kimberly tolson is playing it there teaching how to play it yep um it's 
almost like shuffleboard. You're just flicking this little disc, trying to get in the, the middle of the board there, the hole. Uh, there are some uh, certain rules where, you know, if you if you can uh, take a player out or you have to hit another player's checker or piece if they're on the board. And if you knock them out, you know, they're off the board. And at the end, I think it's 12, uh, you each have a dozen pieces. After that, you look at the board and whatever's left, you're going to score. So in the hole, um, it is, hey, here's a fun fact, actually. When you knock it into the hole, uh, that is called a dookie. I'm not kidding. I'm sorry, it's called what? a dookie. When you, a uh, dookie, dookie. Okay, good to know. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I don't know if it's a Canadian thing because that's where it originated <laughs> from. But uh, when you hit the dookie, you're gonna take it out of the hole there, and you score 20 points. Everything else, you're gonna get 15, 10, or five. Um, you know, depending on where it lands on the board, and it's a race to 100 points. Whoever okay. gets to 100. I just explained the game in two minutes, folks. Yeah. And yet it is. You can, I uh, honestly, I've played it for hours. It is fantastic. My favorite story of this game, the brothers Murph and I at Dice Tower West a couple of years ago, they had never played it before. And I said, we need to play this game. We borrowed the board. And I, I want to apologize to those people at Dice Tower West who really want to play this game. We had that board for hours and oh, hours no. and hours because we, we kept playing it. And then we, uh, Shay, um, uh, another partner oh, yeah, here yeah. on uh, another contributor here on the channel, he came over and his friend, they ended up playing for hours and hours and hours. And we still talk about that. It's the greatest dexterity game. I mean, no, I love dexterity games. They're fun and everything, but this is the one, if I had to only choose one, this is it. That's why it's our number 42, Crokinole. Yeah, it is It is brilliant. Um, if spendy, right? Because, uh, it, you know, it, I think yeah. one of the things that's most satisfying about it, the incredibly smooth flicking action is because, yeah. I mean, these boards, you, you pay a lot, but it's like a family heirloom object that you it is. pass down it is. to your kids and your grandkids and you right. got to take care of it you got to keep it nice and waxed so it's yep yep i mean and so you you do have a crokinole board then right i do i, I had two crokinole boards in fact and wow. um the, the story is i have i had this one i actually uh, backed it on kickstarter from a certain company they do ones that are a lot more affordable so the wood oh, okay. isn't like a, you know they it's not like the high the high quality or top of the line wood but it's Certainly playable. It's wonderful. I ended up just giving it to my nephew because when I played with him, I mean, we, again, me and my nephew, he was talking to trash to his uncle Ruel and we had to go back and forth and play a couple of rounds. Uh, but I ended up giving it to him because it, it is one of those things you want to pass it on. Now, the one I have now, it, it's, it is one of the nicer ones. It did cost a little, a prettier penny, but honestly worth every single cent because i know it's going to get used it's not going to be one of those things oh let's just look at it on the wall no we're taking it down every holiday actually you know we'll, i'll bring it to uh, open game nights when we had them and we would just you know have little tournaments it's like the perfect bar game it's the perfect family game it's the perfect dexterity game again yeah. number 42 crokinole good call good call and thank you uh kimberly tolson the newest contributor to the channel uh if you guys and gals haven't checked her out yet again hit that eye in the top right corner screen uh follow the link um i'll send you a link to uh her uh, crokinole video which is uh yeah. sometimes she does uh, skits and she has characters and whatnot and sometimes she just plays she's straight. Great. Sometimes she does she's top awesome. she does all kinds of stuff she's absolutely phenomenal and so she's yep. a good ambassador for an amazing game number 42 i cannot argue with this at all uh it is not my personal favorite flicking game but oh, i think okay. you could say it is objectively the best flicking game that's out there yep. uh, it's just that's so that's perfect that's uh yeah. yeah good call well we're almost all done right. folks we have one more uh to talk about and it's gonna be kind of continuing a trend i remember the odd number ones are the ones i put on the list the even number ones are the ones that ruel has put on the list and we just had number 43 networks so really is it any surprise at all that number 41 would be roll camera I, you know it's funny you, when you brought up networks i was thinking okay where's the roll camera going to come into this yep i'm so glad it's here yeah the one I, i'm not i it's fantastic it lives up to all the hype but i will let you uh carry on sir oh my gosh um i love this one so much for a lot of the same reasons to be honest that i love the network mm -hmm. so much i said i am a tv junkie i am a movie junkie too and this game does such a wonderful job of replicating thematically the feel of being on a movie set uh uh, you know, you are the director trying to make tough choices, trying to balance the budget, trying to balance the schedule, always dealing with that golden triangle. Um, what is it? What's the golden triangle? Um, you know, uh, time, cost, quality. You can have two. 
You can never have all three. Yeah. You got to sacrifice one of those. <laughs> and this game epitomizes that management style. Because, and the thing that's really beautiful about it is it's a cooperative game. We are all players are taking on different roles. One might be the director. One might be the uh, the sound or the costume designer or the makeup artist or whatever. Which means we all have certain special powers. And when it comes to our turn, this is a dice worker placement game where I grab the big bunch of dice, I roll them, and that indicates the different crew members I have: the cameraman, the grips. Uh, you know, the lighting, uh, you know, text, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. And I've got to decide this round, where am I going to send them on the board? Because we only have so much time. We only have so much money to get this script finished. Because this is the case often with real movies. The script is going under constant revision as, you know, we realize, oh, this scene is just terrible. We can't, this is way over budget. We can't shoot this. Can we rewrite this script? Or, okay, let's uh, rebuild the set because as soon as you're done filming a scene, you got to start tearing that set down and building another one in its place. But if you can be really smart in this kind of little uh, Tetris polyomino tile lane game, you can just rearrange the pieces and, you know, presto changeo, get a completely different set out of it. Kind of like how, you know, almost every bridge you you've ever seen on any episode of Star Trek is the same bridge and they just keep redressing it over and over again for different starships and whatnot. And so it brings that idea to life. And um, the coolest thing by far though is because this is a cooperative game, everybody has a hand of cards in their hand called idea cards. And at the same time, at the beginning of every turn, a new problem card is going to come up. And there's all kinds of problems. Usually they're pretty funny, but still kind of based in the real problems you'd have on a, on a live uh, shooting set. And um, if, you know whatever the situation you find yourself in, you're trying to figure out, okay, where should I put my dice? Am I going to work on building the set? Are we going to do rewrites? Or are we going to shoot now? Um, which means I have to give up my dice as worker placement and instead put them on set because the uh, dice themselves are part of the scenes that we have to set up so we can actually shoot and get this finished film. But my favorite action is the production meeting. Because if I, and you can use any die for that, and if you do, what that means is everybody gets to take an idea from their hand and add it to the pot. It's like we've literally, okay, we're over budget, we're out of time, the, the, uh, the Riders Guild is on strike. We need an idea. Let's let's call a production meeting, and then everybody looks. Okay, um, you know, and and meanwhile, you know, what you know, Ruel can see the problem I've got on my turn. He's like, let's have a meeting. Let's. Have, I've got the perfect card for it. <laughs> and so Ruel puts his card. And I, yeah, that's okay. <gasps> But Jen's card, oh my gosh, that's the perfect one. Okay, let's play that. And so we end up playing one of those cards. That becomes a thing that is always a lifesaver. These idea cards are very powerful. But the interesting thing is, one of the ideas is gone. Okay, that's garbage. We're not doing that one. One becomes the thing we do, and then the other one goes into a queue that we can actually activate later if we spend dice. So... I mean, I, I love the cooperative gameplay. I'm, cooperative games are always my favorites. Um, and a cooperative dice worker placement game, that's a real rarity. That also has yeah. polyomino Tetra-style tile laying, that yeah. has set collection elements, that has special powers, um, but that has theme. The th I mean, I, I talked about this a little bit in the networks, but it's even more so here. Because in this game, we are not the executives making the high-level decisions. We are the people on set making the day-to-day, moment-to-moment decisions. And those executives, oh, as often as not, those are the problem cards we're trying to solve because the executive <laughs> needs X, Y, or Z. And, um, yeah, if you have any interest in the art of movie making or TV or, or you know, putting on any kind of creative endeavor where a lot of people have to work, a lot of this game reminds me personally of my time as a video game creative director. I did that for mm. almost two decades. I designed video games. So a lot of the same feelings I got trying to get all of those pieces together comes through in this game. And I love it to pieces. Oh my gosh, we are just getting into the best of all time here, Ruel. And uh, yeah, my number 41, <laughs> our number 41 roll camera is definitely one yeah. of them. Yeah, I, I knew this would be on, on yeah. the list. I'm so glad it is. Uh, you were hyped about it, um, you know, when it came out. And then I was able actually to, uh, to do a run through for with the expansion uh, mm -hmm. here on the channel as well. And I was blown away. And just that that marriage of theme and uh, mechanisms. Like, I, I didn't expect the polyomino thing, which was great. I, I was like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. I have to actually design the set that we're going to be doing the scenes in. And then the genres, the themes, everything. Oh, it, it all works. It works so well. <laughs> And you know what? As much as we hype it, I feel like this game is a little underrated by yes, folks. Yes, definitely. I, right? I, I think more people need to be into this game. It's so wonderful. But yeah, great choice for our number 41, um, Roll Camera. Okay, well, that's it, folks. <laughs> we have made it. And we will be back again soon, continuing our countdown. But 
The important thing is, did you hear Ruel or me say the secret word, Kinesia? Because if you did, you need to go back and figure out what game was that? When, when, when did they say that? What were they talking? Okay, I got it. Send that as the subject of an email to contest at rotto.com. And a week from now, on April 18th, no, I'm, I'm sorry, 18th. April 19th. We will be filming the next episode of the live R&R show, and we will do a drawing, and one lucky winner will get a copy of a sponsor of the show. Oh my gosh, it is so amazingly good. Paradox Initiative. I cannot recommend this game highly enough. Did I mention, Ruel? Uh, it made my wife's number two. The only thing that beat it was yes. Ark Nova, one of the greatest games of all time. Um, yep. Pretty yeah. good endorsement right there. Yep, 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 yep. Cannot recommend highly enough. Well, okay, uh, then I think we are done. Unless you can think of anything else, Ruel. No, I think we're I think we're good. I mean, we're we're getting to the top forty now, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, we've been doing this list for a few months here, and I'm enjoying seeing all the great games that we're talking about, and I cannot wait for the next batch. Yep, uh, yeah, I agree. And I mean, I, I, I think one of the strengths of how we're doing this too, I mean, because we both have very different tastes. I, and I really yes. like the breadth and depth. I don't think either of us ever said, well, oh, that's a, maybe that's not a game for me, but that's not a bad game. That's still one of the greatest games. So I am yeah. very, very pleased with this output so far. And folks, if you would like, if, you, if you're just joining us now because, hey, we're at the top 50, well, there are 50 other games we talked about that are fantastic. Hit that eye in the top right corner screen. Follow the show notes. Or just go to rnr.rado.com and you can catch everything we've talked about up till now, including the extended episodes where things go really off the rails and you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well then, okay. uh, all right. Then uh, you're good to go. I'm good to go. We'll be back again go. next yeah. week, folks. Same Rotto time, same Ruel channel. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Ruel, for joining me on this crazy trip. And thanks again, finally, to sponsor the show, Paradox Initiative, live on Kickstarter now. Everybody have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye.